Amen. He is coming. Hi, um, I'm not a big joke teller, you know that. Um, but uh, see, we have a snow day, and I have this story. I think God prepared me for ministry since I've been a little child. And I remember when I was about eight, I read this joke, and I always think of it when it snows. So I'm going to share it. I've probably shared it with you half a dozen times. But there was a, um, a, far- a Texas farmer that went to church one day, and only one person showed up at the church. And so the preacher asked him, he said, um, do you want me to go ahead and have the sermon or do you want to just go home? And he said, well, he said, uh, if, if I went out to feed my cows one day and only one of them showed up, I would feed him. And so the preacher started talking. And you know how we are. We, he preached an hour, two hours, about three hours. And the preacher quit. And he said, well, what would you think? And he said, well, he said, if I went out to feed my cows one day and only one of them showed up, I wouldn't feed them all the hay. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> no promises. I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad we had church today. What great music, church. How about that? What a great way to start. And uh, we've really been blessed in, in sound and music today. I want to talk this morning about the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew chapter 25. It's as we continue our series of stewardship, we're going to talk about today the stewardship of our priorities. And uh, this is the uh, last of these parables. And next time, uh, of course, next week, we'll, uh, we'll uh, have Baptist Men's Day. And then we'll have uh, Keith and Mark will speak. And then uh, the following, two weeks from today, we'll be in Jacksonville. AJ and Jacob and I will be in Jacksonville for the pastor's conference there. And uh, Brother Johnson Gumpton will preach. And then when we come back on the third Sunday, I will talk about the, the, the widow's might in our last of our stewardship Series, but today I want to talk about the, par- the stewardship of our priorities. Uh, and in the two previous parables, we talked about being prepared, and they were about stewardship, about how we used what God gave us, but they're also about the second coming. And so the king is coming, and that's what Jesus uh, wanted to make a big point with us in these parables. I want to emphasize that with you this morning, and just before I read the scripture, I want to give us a little context with it. If you look at Matthew chapter 24, Jesus has there in that almost that entire chapter gives a teaching, or as scholars would call it, a discourse to his disciples, instructing them on the second coming. And so Matthew chapter 24, uh, over to uh, verse 32, uh, is instruction, Jesus teaching us. And then from chapter 24, verse 32, you have the parable of the fig tree, which basically says there are signs, and you need to watch the signs, and when you see the signs, then you know he's near. And then in verse 45, we have a parable about the faithful and sensible servant. And then we have this parable in chapter 25 about the ten virgins. And then last week, we talked about the parable of the talents. And the week before that, the sheep and the goats. So what Jesus did is he gave us instruction, detail, and then he gave five parables to give clarity to his instruction. Now, Jesus is the master teacher. If you look at biblical teaching, uh, I was telling our Sunday school class today, Jesus spent a great deal of time and energy instructing us on the end times. He wanted us to know the king is coming, church, and and we need to know that. So I'm going to enforce that today. All of these parables teach a different point, but they are all about stewardship. The sheep and the goats, we see that preparation means taking care of the least among us. We take care of those that we consider the least, that if we take care of them, we're taking care of who? Jesus, that's right. So it's really important that we do that. Now, lest we think that if we take care of the least and then we're done, then Jesus gives us another parable. He gives us the parable of the talents. And he says there that preparation is using the resources that God has given you. You has given you and me and all of us talents and abilities. And so when we take care of those things, we are being prepared for his coming. That's important. And, and so today we're going to talk about 
the stewardship of our priority. Now, priorities are very important, church. You, you and I, whether you know it or not, would you match that Kleenex down? I can't see the clock. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thanks, Jacob. We appreciate you, brother. I love you. <laughs> um, you and I all set priorities, whether we know it or not. And Jesus is saying that you and I need to set our priorities on the kingdom of God because we don't know when he's coming back. Now, that's basically what my sermon is today, and you could probably all leave before the snow melts. But I want you to hear the rest of it because it's very important. He talks about priority in the Bible. Over in Matthew chapter 6, as he's, as he's doing his instruction, finishing the Sermon on the Mount, he says, don't collect for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. But collect for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart is. Jesus said, listen, when you build up your treasure on earth, you make sure you build up treasure that's eternal and lasting. Don't build up treasure that's fleeting, that will go away. Build up things that are in, 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 that are, won't be lost, imperishable. That was the word I wanted. And then when he was talking about worry... You know, we all have a lot to worry about. And, and when we wake up in the morning, we could worry or we could set our mind on our priority. Jesus said, in response to worry, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will have enough worry to take care of itself. Jesus says, get up in the morning. Your priority and my priority should be to seek first the kingdom of God. That's our priority. That, that's a good priority. Then right down in chapter 7 of that same instruction, he says that there are two foundations that you and I, as we build our lives, we have the choice, the ability to make two choices about our foundations. We can, we can say, so therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, Jesus says, and acts on them will be like the sensible man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded the house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on rock. But everyone who hears these words and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded the house and it collapsed. And the destruction was great. And Jesus said in Matthew 16, what will it benefit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his life? Or what man will give in exchange... What will a man give in exchange for his life? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels and the glory of his Father, and he will reward each according to what he has done. So let, let me just put that into perspective for you. If you were one of the three people that won the, what, 500 and however many million dollars, I mean, that's a lot of money by any stretch of the imagination. If you won that kind of money, and yet you lost your soul, you made the worst deal imaginable. Nothing is worth your soul. So Jesus says, set your priorities. Make sure that we manage our priorities correctly. So today we have the parable of the ten virgins. Dr. John MacArthur, who I greatly admire his work and writing, he writes of this passage. He says, the parable of the ten virgins is given to accentuate the incalculable importance of being spiritually prepared to meet Christ when he returns to earth. Because after he appears, unbelievers who are still alive will have no further chance for salvation. Church, this is a vitally important passage. And so I'm talking to you about giving and stewardship and the stewardship of all of these things during this month. But today I'm talking about the stewardship of your priority. You've got to decide where you place your priority. Now, now you got to understand a little bit about a Jewish wedding, and I'm going to read the passage to you, and we're going to talk about it. But I, I just want you to understand this background a little bit. You know, when Jewish people got married, they did several things. They, they had an engagement, and when they had an engagement, they basically, the two parents got together, and they wouldn't even need the bride and the groom. They don't even have to show up. And they would write out a marriage contract and they would say, dad's going to give so much money to get his daughter married, a dowry, and, he's, and the, 
the dad or the groom is going to accept it and they're all going to come together on a certain date. It's all good. It's all signed and they're married. There's nothing, there's no contact, no, yes, I want to get married. Would you marry me? The parents all arranged all that. Then there was a betrothal. And, and then there, they actually came together and they had a marriage ceremony and they exchanged vows with each other. And afterwards, they were considered married. They didn't touch each other during this ceremony. They didn't go home together. There was no honeymoon. They had vows and they got married. Uh, if, if the the husband died, which sometimes happened in that day of not such good medical care, then the wife was considered a, a widow and they had never consummated the marriage. If, if they divorced, if they decided that we don't like each other, we just can't stand each other, then they had a divorce, a legal ceremony. It was a big deal. And what, what was happening is the young man then after this this commitment would go out and try to set himself up and make a living. And so the, the father or the bride wouldn't let her daughter go with him until he could support himself and provide a home and had a job and had a way of making a living. So it might take several months. It might take a year. And again, the couple had never come together. They had never gotten married. And then, and then they would have, after this was all over with, they would have the marriage feast. And that's the setting for our parable here, the, the scene of the marriage feast. And what would happen is the broom would get all of his groomsmen, and sometime after dark, sometimes often near midnight, they would, he would travel to the bride's house, and they would light these torches, so I guess so. They would let everybody in the village know they were having a big marriage feast. And so he would show up at the bride's house, and there she would have all of her attendants, and they would have their torches, and they would march to the place of the festivity. And it might last a week. I mean, this was a big deal. And of course, that's where Jesus turned the water to wine. And that's the setting for this story here. And after that was all over, you're going to love this. After that week-long celebration, the groomsman, the best man, would take the bride's wife and place it, place it in the hand of her husband. And they would go off together and begin their life together. It was really a, an amazing thing. But they would have this marriage feast. When they walked through the town, they headed to the marriage feast. You, you and I have to understand the marriage feast. and It's a time of great celebration. Jesus says, and, and I'm going to read it to you in a little bit, in Revelation 19, that when the church is called to heaven, we're going to have the marriage feast of the Lamb. And we're going to be invited to a great marriage feast. Church, you want to be there. You want to be a part of that one. You don't want to miss that day. What a day. And I'm going to read it to you in a little bit, but I want you to see it. J.C. Ryle, great commentator, the Bishop of Liverpool of the 19th century, summarizes today's parable by comparing and contrasting it with the parable of the talents. He says, the ten virgins is very like that parable of the talents. Both direct our minds to the same important event, that is the second coming. Both bring before us the same people, that is the members of the professing church of Christ. The virgins and the servants are one and the same people. But the same people regarded from a different point and viewed on different sides. The practical lesson of each parable is the main point of difference. Diligence is the keynote of last week's address in the parable of the talents. And vigilance is the keynote of this parable. We've got to be vigilant. We've got to be watching. We've got to be waiting. So we're going to we're going to look at this passage together. Now, I'm going to do it in the same format I've done the last two Sundays, and you probably recognize that by now. And now what I'm doing is I'm teaching you a method to study the Bible. And you might say, Jim, I've got a way. Well, that's fine, then you don't have to use this. But if you don't have a way, then I'm going to give you this way, and I'm dividing this passage. You can read every passage of Scripture and divide it up this way. And I'm going to, I'm going to tell you some light bulbs, and those are just things that go off in my mind when I read the passage. Oh, by the way, I only have eight of them today. You'll be thrilled. <laughs> and then, and then I'm, I'm going to give you some questions. If I could ask the author a question, this is what I would ask him. And so the author of this passage today is Matthew, and he's quoting from Jesus. So either one would be fine, but I would ask them this answer. I only have one question. And then I'm going to cover with you arrows. Arrows are the things that penetrate my heart, that touch me and move me to do something. In church, I only have one arrow, so it's pretty short. We'll get started. 
Let me read the passage with you, and we'll study together. Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 through 13. And the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the groom. Five of them were foolish and five were sensible. When the foolish took their lamps, they didn't take oil with them, but the sensible ones took oil in their flask with their lamps. Since the groom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. In the middle of the night, there was a shout, Here's the groom, come out and meet him. Then all of those virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. But the foolish ones said to the sensible ones, Give us some of your oil, because our lamps are going out. The sensible ones answered, No, there won't be enough for us and for you. Go instead to those who sell and buy oil for yourselves. When they'd gone to buy some, the groom arrived. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet. And the door was shut. Later, the rest of the virgins also came and said, Master, Master, open up for us. But he replied, I assure you, I do not even know you. Therefore, be alert, because you don't know the day or the time. Father, thank you for your word. This clear instruction, I just pray you'll press it on us today. That we won't leave the same way. That your spirit will touch us and move us guide us and convict us. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So, my eight points. Light bulbs. Things that I notice. Then, the word then, for then the kingdom of heaven will be, then refers to the Second coming of Christ, just like last week, for it is just like a man going on a journey. Jesus began that, for it, the coming of the kingdom of God is referring to the second coming of Christ. That's all that is. You need to notice that. Jesus, for whatever else he teaches in this parable, in all of these parables, he's teaching us that he's coming back again. Church, he is coming back again. The second thing that I want you to see is the main character of the story is the bridegroom. We call him the groom. The groom, the male, the man. The man is always God. The man is always, in the Old Testament, the bridegroom was God. Israel, his people, were the, was, were, were the, was the bride. In this parable, in the New Testament, we find the bridegroom is Jesus. He's always Jesus. That's who it is. So the bridegroom is the main character. The bridegroom comes for the wedding party. He enters a covenant relationship with his bride. And, of course, the symbolism is unmissable. You can't, you can't walk away from it. The symbolism is that Jesus is going to come back for the church one day. And so he's the bridegroom. He'll come for the church. In Revelation chapter 19, I want to share that with you. And if, you, if you're not a person that reads the book of Revelation, it's really pretty clear. Over in, in chapter 19, verse 6, this is the marriage this is the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is what it will look like in heaven's shore. And then John writes, I heard something like a vast multitude, like the sound of cascading water and the rumbling of loud thunder. Hallelujah, because our Lord God the Almighty has begun to reign. Listen, church, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory because the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has prepared herself. She was permitted to wear fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. And he said to me, John, right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. And these words of God are true. Church, that is a great thing. You know, when you go, you don't have to decide what you're going to wear to the marriage feast of the Lamb. We're all going to wear white. Because in the eyes of God, we'll be righteous and holy. Clean by Christ, not by our own work. Isn't that great? Isn't that a great day? That's what Jesus is talking about here. So the main character is the bridegroom, who is Jesus. The third thing, you do not know the day or the hour. I, wanna, I want you to know, if you don't get that, look at verse 13. Therefore, be alert, because you don't know the day or the hour. If we look at all these parables, if we look at the parable of the fig tree, Jesus says there's a fig tree over here, and the fig tree, when it starts to bear fruit, then you can know the Son of Man will come soon. And then he tells the parable of the ten virgins, and he tells the parable of the talents, and he tells the parable of the sheep and the goats, and he tells the parable of the faithful servant. And in all of those, he says, he will come back at a time we don't expect. You know, that's the great, that's the great mystery that everybody wants to know. 
And you can go right today, you could go to Barnes & Noble, or if Lifeway was open, you could go to Lifeway. They're not open on Sunday, but go tomorrow, and you can find writers who will tell you when Jesus is coming back. I'm going to tell you they're wrong. They don't know. Jesus has told us that. He said that. You do not know the day or the hour. In verse 36 of chapter 24, again, he, Jesus, went in, in his instruction, he says, now concerning that day and the hour, no one knows, neither the angels nor the son, except the father. Nobody knows. So we don't know. We never will know. And if anybody tells you they don't know, the Bible says you won't know. It's going to be as these parables teach, later than expected. In fact, Acts chapter 1, verse 7 said, it's not for you to know the times or the periods the Father set by his own authority. And I think, church, I think that means we're not going to know. So the time is unknown. Jesus could come back before I finish preaching. He could come back tomorrow, or he could come back a thousand years from now. His message to us is to be ready and waiting on him to be prepared. That's what he wants us to do. That's all he wants us to do. You know, we always want to know stuff we aren't supposed to know. That's what got Eve in trouble. Probably got Adam in trouble too. It gets us in trouble all the time. We're not going to know this one. The fourth thing. The ten bridesmaids represent the church of Christ. Jesus was talking to the disciples. He was talking to the whole church. He's talking to the men that are going to head the church when it gets started. He's saying there are going to be 10 people that are going to show up for the wedding. They all think they're involved. They all look the same. They all brought torches. They all brought a little bit of oil. But there are 10 bridesmaids. They're all there. And, and uh, then, then, this, then the second thing that we learn is that five of them are actually going to make it to the feast. and Five will not. So of the professing church, the people that believe that they know Jesus, there's part that will go and part will not. Okay. Then he says there are five bridesmaids who are wise. That's the fifth statement. See how fast we're moving through this? And these five wise virgins symbolize true Christians, the real Christians. And here, here's what happens. And I'll just go through the parable with you briefly and tell you what happened. They, they took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. They all did that. That was an act of obedience. They all had a part to play. They all showed up. They were ready when the groom, to be ready to, when the groom arrived. They all had their lamps in their hand. They were full of oil. They were ready to go. They all obeyed. They were all there, 10 of them. We got 10 right now. But then the bridegroom was delayed. And so the bridesmaids, five had fuel for the delay and five did not. And so the other five that did not, they had to go back into town to buy some more. So the difference between the two is preparation. And, and uh, we're going to talk a lot more about this, but, you know, that's, that's what it all comes down to. They all seemed okay at the front. And so these five were wise because they were prepared. And then, of course, there were five that were foolish. And you got it. They were foolish because they weren't prepared, because they didn't have oil for the long stay. They had oil for the initial stay. They had their lamps. They showed up. They were dressed right. Everybody thought they were bridesmaids. They just didn't have enough to wait. And so they were foolish. And that's in the words of Jesus. And I'm going to talk to you more. Don't leave yet. But I want you to recognize that when the bridegroom came, there was no chance to change your mind. I want you to hear that, church. That the ones that were foolish couldn't say, they did say, oh, we'll go back to town and get some. No, they were late. The door was closed. They did say to the other five bridesmaids, give us some of your oil. And you read this story and you say, those other five bridesmaids, they're not very charitable, are they? But they brought enough for their own preparation, not for someone else. You see, somebody can't get you into the kingdom of heaven. Somebody can't do that for you. You have to do that yourself. You have to do your own preparation. And I have to do my own preparation. There are certain things that we have to take care of. I wish my parents could have done it for me. It would have saved me a lot of grief. I wish I could have done it for my children and saved them a lot of grief. But I have to do it myself and they have to do it themselves. That's what's important. 
I want you to know that a torch without fuel is worthless. A bridesmaid that can't do her job is of no value to the groom. And so is a person that says they believe, but doesn't have a saving relationship with Christ. And we'll talk more. Number seven, the groom was delayed. The Bible tells us that. Verse five, since the groom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Often the wedding party would begin at midnight. People get sleepy at night. About 9.30 or 10 o'clock, I'm about done. By midnight, I'm done. This wedding party was done too. They, they weren't half were awake, half were asleep. They all fell asleep, waiting on the groom. It says he was delayed. It says he came in the middle of the night, and then there was a shout. Do you get, do you get the symbolism when Jesus said that when he comes back, there'll be a shout in the eastern sky? Normal history will be interrupted by a single shout that'll change everything. It'll be that sudden, that unexpected, that much out of the blue. That's what the Bible says. I wonder, there were five awake and five asleep. Is Jesus telling us that half the church is asleep? I don't know. Number eight. The wise virgins are rewarded with heaven. What happened is while they, the bridegroom came and the wise virgins went in with him to the marriage feast. And later, those who were ready with him went in to the wedding banquet and the door was closed. You see, the opportunity for changing your mind was over and when the rest of the virgins came and said, Master, Master, open up for us. And he said, I don't even know you. You're not even mine. So those are the eight things that are light bulbs. There's one question I would ask the author. Only one. What exactly does being prepared really look like? What does it look like? And you know, I I know you're saying, well, Jim, prepared is not even mentioned in the text. It's not mentioned in the text. We're talking about five foolish virgins and five uh, wise virgins. The wise ones were prepared and the foolish ones were not. I'm just drawing kind of a natural parallel there saying that, that we're going to talk about preparation. So what is wise and what is prepared in a biblical sense? I don't want to read a lot into this. And there's there's all kinds of ways of of interpreting a parable. You can say it's an allegory that everything in the parable means something. I I don't think it's an allegory. I don't think the oil means the Holy Spirit or it means works. or I think it means prepared. It's very simple. Jesus is telling us a simple story. He's telling a simple story to people that don't have a big education and don't understand a lot of things. And he's just telling them a story so they can grasp it. He says, on the last day when he comes back, there are going to be five people ready and five who aren't. Out of ten who all thought they were. It's very important stuff. We need to listen to it. So we're not really told. In the talent parable, the talents being prepared is using God's gifts. In, in the parable of the sheep and the goats, being prepared is taking care of the least among us. In this parable, it's taking care of our priority. Jesus says we got to take care of things before he comes back. But here's what I think being prepared looks like. I think, first of all, being prepared is taking God at his word that he's coming back. Now, I'm not going to tell you how many hundreds of times Jesus made reference to the second coming in his, in, in his teachings. In four Gospels, uh, hundreds of times, 300 and something references in the New Testament. He talked about it a lot. He wanted us to know he's coming back. He came the first time, nobody knew him. He comes back the second time, nobody will miss him. Everybody will know. In fact, the Bible says that every knee will bow. The things will be so turned around in this world. All of those people that say all of those things, all of those terrible people that commit all of these sins, they're going to bow at the feet of Jesus and beg for forgiveness. It's going to be a big day in history. He's coming back. So I think you and I, church, we should be aware and full. There are preachers that don't believe he's coming back. You can go to the bookstore and buy a book that doesn't believe Jesus is coming back, that flies in the face of everything that he talks about. I mean, he devoted this much to the last bit of his teaching to telling us he's coming back. So he's coming back. I believe that. So being prepared is taking God's word that he's coming back. It means you and I living our life 
like he could come back at any moment. It means not, not saying, well, I don't really have to worry about that because I'm covered by God's grace, or I, I can do that because, you know, that's okay. I, I don't have to worry. Or, or this, this is my favorite. One day, I'm going to get this fixed. One day, I'm going to fix it. That's not living like you think he's going to come back in any minute. And you all know this, and, and I know this, and we're all aware of this. You, you and I, are we're, we're one heartbeat from eternity sitting right here this morning. One heartbeat, that's all it takes. We're in the presence of God. Being prepared is knowing and doing, obeying what God told us. Do you, do you live your life like it really matters how you live? Do you do the things that God has called us to do? I, I know Christians, and you probably know Christians, that the only way that you would know that they're Christians is they would tell you that. Because they don't live the way Jesus told us to live. And you know, there, there, there are Christians that don't want, you talk, they don't want me talking about their money. Because it's their money. And they've acquired it, and they've earned it, and they've, they've got it. And they get to decide how to do it with. The parable of talent says that God gave us all that. And he gave us that as a test to see how we'll use it. Whether we'll use it for kingdom things or use it for earthly things. And he'll hold us accountable. And remember the, 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 the poor little guy that only had one talent. He was thrown into eternal punishment. Not because he cheated or stole. But because he didn't use the master's money for the master's purposes. So I think. Obedience is very important in our life. How about our moral behavior? There are Christians today. There are Christians today who come to church who commit adultery and think that's okay because God forgave them. And God will forgive us of that. But if you don't persist in it, you haven't repented of it. If you persist in it, keep doing it. There, there's people that believe that a homosexual relationship it's all love and it's all good. The Bible doesn't teach that. There's people that, that believe they can go on their computer and look at anything they want to and then get up and come to church on Sunday morning. They can take part of anything they want. And so is that living like we're preparing for his return? Or what about the way we treat other people? Jesus said we'd be known by how much we love other people. That's how we'd be identified. Uh, I want to put that up. David, if you would do that, put that quote up there. Jesus said this in John chapter 13. I wanted you to see this and be reminded of it. I've mentioned this a lot because this verse weighs heavily on my life and my, and, my, and my heart. I give you a new commandment to love one another just as I have loved you. You must also love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. In other words, the way that people will spot us in a crowd is the way we love other people. That's how they spot us. He doesn't spot us. People don't spot us by our moral behavior, by how good we are to each other, about the way we treat the, the way the way we treat our, you know, the people. But we love everybody. When we walk out of this place, we are spotted, identified by the way that we love each other. That's that's our priority. That's what Jesus said. And I'm gonna tell you, Christians are known for all kinds of things. And I hear it all the time. They're known by what they oppose. They are known by what they do not like. They are known about what they don't like about other people, how they judge people. Here's a quote that I actually wrote down from somebody, how they go to church and do nothing to help others around them. That's an actual quote. Why are Christians known like that when Jesus said, we will be known by how we love one another? You know, I've told you before, it's not like we put a shirt on that says Christian. We don't wear our little jersey. We could do that. That would be simpler. We all wore a jersey. And so you would spot the Christians. You get on an airplane, there'd be the people with their jersey on. It says, Christian, there's a brother. There's a sister. But no, Jesus said we would spot people in a crowd by the way they love each other. That's our identifying characteristic. Are we prepared if we don't love people the way Jesus said? So all this comes down to kind of one thing. James said that. He said, you know, and I'm not talking to you about, and, and you say, well, now, Jim, I guess you're saying that I got to do certain stuff to get saved. No, I'm not telling you that. I'm not telling you that. And you got to be really careful here. 
there's some quicksand in this illustration. Because some people think that if I treat my brother good and if I use my talents well and if um, I use my priorities well, then I'm going to go to heaven. I'm a good man. It's not that. Jesus said the only way we're saved is by faith. That we're only saved by grace. That God, God changes us. He gives us an opportunity to come to him in repentance. And he'll forgive anybody of anything and wash us clean and make us a new person. And that's the key right there. Once you're made a new person, then you do these things that God has called you to do. You are a different person. James said that. I want to, I want to get to that. In verse 18, chapter 2, you all know it. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I'll show you faith from my works, you believe that God is one. The demons also believe and they shudder. James says the demons even believe in God. If that's all you do is believe in God and hadn't changed your life, are you a five, one of the five foolish virgins? If you just say you believe and nothing's happened. Because when you believe, then you love one another. I have another little quote here that I found this week I thought you might like. Jesus did not say that all men will know you're my disciples if you just pass laws, suppress immorality, restore decency to the family and government, but rather if you love one another. That's really important. There's a connection between what we say in our heart and what we do with our life, you see. If you love Christ, you have a saving faith in Christ and he's forgiven you and washed your sins clean and you, and you are a new creation, then you will love people the way Jesus said to love them. You will pick out the people that are most unlovable and say, you know, I can love that person because to God, that's who I am. And when I love them, I'm loving him. You know, Marshall, that probably gets you through a lot of days because I bet there's some people over there you don't like. <laughs> I mean, let's just face it. But you can love them the way Jesus loved them. And when they walk in the door of East Oaks Outreach Ministry, I don't think there's anybody over there would ever say they're not loved. We got to love people the way Christ told us to. Our saving faith prepares us for our return. I'd still ask Jesus if I had a chance. But I believe that the preparation here is that we obey Christ and then we're doing, we have the faith that saves us and then we're doing the things that he's called us to do until we return. Church, that means we're busy people. We're about his work. We're waiting on his return. We're not earning our salvation. We're not building up points with God, but we're working while we have the opportunity. The last thing, there's one arrow that pierces my heart. I only have one. Some believers, even, in, even some people in the church, are not genuine believers. In fact, Jesus said that in these parables. He said some of them are like goat and sheep. There's the goats on the left and the sheep on the right. Some are like wheat and tares. Some will be spared and used. Some will be thrown into the fire. Some are like good slaves and some like wicked slaves. Some are wise and some are foolish. That's what Jesus said. Jesus spent a lot of time talking about a church that was populated with people that were fooling themselves. Part of the people thought they were saved and they weren't. And part of the people were saved and thought they were saved. I don't know that you can read a lot into this, but Jesus is certainly telling us in this parable that a large part of the professing church, 50% of it, it must be a problem because he keeps talking about it in parable after parable. It's not, I don't, I don't think you get hung up over the numbers, but I think you get hung over, over the emphasis of it. I wish I could be comfortable about it. I wish I could come in here and preach to you really good sermons that you just like to hear and you all left with a good warm feeling. You said, boy, that was wonderful. But I think the Bible rocks my world sometimes. And sometimes I need to stand in this pulpit and rock your world because I think there are people that need to hear it. And God puts that on my heart. So I say it to you this morning with all the sincerity that I can. This is not a sermon of warning, but church, you have been warned. This is the word of God. There's people that sit in our pews that apparently aren't genuine believers. So I challenge you, I urge you, I plead with you to examine your life and to look for fruit of Christian service. Jesus says that if you're connected to the vine, you'll bear fruit for him. It's not like you will, you should, you might sometime in the future, but you will bear fruit for him. 
you will be productive. Now, not all of us are real productive. Not all of us do something that you and I can measure. But I'll tell you what, if God's called you from being a sinner and he calls you to walk with him and he filled you with his spirit, he will change every one of us to the person that he wants us to be. Over time, some of us are a real work and a real challenge, I know. I am. And that's probably why I didn't start preaching until I was about 45 years old. Because I'm such a work that God had to do. But he'll do it. He will do that. God calls us to serve him and to be different when he serves us. When we serve him. So when we set our priorities right, we're setting Christ at the center of our life. And, and you know, if you say, well, Jim, I, I've made a decision a long time ago, but I don't really see any signs of Jesus working in my life. And I'd say, get on your knees and come to him today and say, Lord, I, I want you to take over my life. I need your forgiveness and I need your salvation and I need your certainty that I'm with you. That's what God calls us to do. Jesus said on the last day, almost verbatim what he told us in, in this passage in verse 13. He says, the, he says, I do not even know you. Over, over in, in, in Matthew chapter 7, he's talking about the kingdom of God. And he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. See that, that thing about work, how faith turns us into action? Oh, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, we didn't, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we drive out demons? We're talking about preachers here. People that prophesy and drive out demons, they're the preachers. They're, they're the people proclaiming the word of God. They're going to be preachers that stand before God on the last day. And he'll say, I don't even know you. Depart from me. That's a stern warning from the word of our Lord. So church, I love you. I say it out of love because I do love you. And I am so concerned. But the word of God says there are counterfeit ones among us. Can you imagine being in in church all your life, hearing the word, sometimes even getting a warm rush with music like we had today, because we have some great music today. That'll make you feel good. But never really making a commitment for Christ. Can you imagine being here and never really being committed? In fact, the way they describe that person is they're inoculated against salvation. They've heard it so much that they're resistant to it, that it just kind of runs off of them. They sit here comfortably, week and month, and year and then on the last days they hear the worst thing that any of us could ever hear I don't even know you church this is our opportunity for grace everybody sitting here today now I'm through with all the bad stuff because Christ offers us forgiveness everybody here He's made wide. He doesn't care what you did. He doesn't care about your past. He doesn't care about all the things that you've done. He doesn't care about what you think or what you do. He says if you will come to him, he'll forgive you. Carte blanche right there. He'll just forgive you. He'll fill you with his spirit. He'll use you until he takes you home. That's the best deal there is. There's nothing like it. And, and so I, I say it to you, I'm, I'm not a fire and brimstone preacher, but I say it to you with whatever fire and brimstone that I have, that God has given you an opportunity for grace that on the last day he won't give. So if you have a doubt in your heart, then you come to him and make it right and get it fixed today.